Good afternoon. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. It's a beautiful day outside, right? So I'm excited about being here. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. And um, before I get started, though, I, I really want to acknowledge and commend uh, the student life staff because this is such a great program. So let's put your hands together and give them a big, big round of applause. Um, as we talk about uh, leadership today, I, I'm very passionate about leadership and I'll share with you some experiences and some stories. And um, to have a program like this at Long Beach City College is, is just a wonderful opportunity. So I commend all of you for taking advantage on a, on a beautiful Friday uh, to be here um, and to commit yourself to uh, your own personal and professional development. So congratulations on that piece. So I'm here from Rio Hondo College. and. Um, I, you know, a lot of those, the titles and the tie and all that stuff, I want you to kind of set aside, and I just want you to see me as a real person, right? Because a few years, well, more than a few years ago, I was in your seat, okay? And I never thought of myself as a leader, and I never even took advantage of any leadership opportunities. Um, and when I introduce my, uh, myself to people, what I first like to do is just start with my cultural identity, okay? So I'm half black and half Korean. I was born in South Korea, and I grew up in Northern California. My wife is Vietnamese, so my daughter is black, Korean, and Vietnamese, right? So it's really important for us as parents to make sure that we teach her her culture, her values, and we really want her to have a really strong sense of identity in terms of who she is and, and to really develop that self-confidence. And uh, when I was young, I, that wasn't anything my parents focused on, right? So, being black and Korean and not quite sure what was going on and how people perceived me. It took some time for me to really develop my own identity. And so um, my wife and I really are intentional now, based on my experience, to really make sure that our daughter understands who she is and that she's comfortable in her own skin and she has a really strong sense of self. And so as we talk today about leadership and we talk about identity and we talk about success, it's going to be really important for you to start to identify who you are and what you're about. Okay, so that's going to be a critical piece to your own uh, development as we move further. So I grew up humble. I was taught to be humble, to not be loud, to be more quiet, to respect my adults, my elders. And so when someone told me something that was older than me, that was the truth, right? I never questioned that. Um, I was pretty quiet. I was an introvert. So for me to be up here and talking to you now, I would have never imagined that I would be able to do that because that wasn't me. I was the type of person, when I was in school, I'd sit in the back of the room, and uh, they'd ask for volunteers to do a classroom presentation, and I was the one that would look away, and I hope they don't call on me, and i try to sink down in my seat. <laughs> and then I'd be like the last one, because the, the teacher would say, well, who hasn't gone yet? And then everyone's like, Daryl hasn't gone. So then it's like, OK. So I, I hated speaking in front of people, and, and so that was just me in terms of how I grew up. I'm the youngest one in my family. I have an older sister. She's two years older than me. Um, and I'm the first in my family to go to college. So I was born in South Korea, so when my mom and I and my family came over to the United States, my mom didn't speak any English at all. So my experience growing up was teaching my mom English, but also teaching her how to navigate life in the United States, right? And so I remember I, I was like six or seven years, maybe seven or eight years old, and I would go with her to the bank, and I would be the liaison to help her open up the bank account, right? And I would go with her to the grocery store, and I would be the one who would count out the money and, and be the transaction with the cashier, because um, my mom wasn't comfortable in, in her language skills. And uh, there was one time where um, my mom always told me to study this book. She came home with this book one day, and she said, you need to study this book. My mom, what book is this? I got school, I got homework, and I'm maybe like 10 or 11. And she always told me to study this book for about two weeks. And it was, um, it was a DMV book. It was a driving book to learn how to take the test for the DMV, right? She kept telling me to study this book, and I'm like, why do I got to study this book, right? I can't drive yet, Mom. I thought she just wanted me to prepare early to be a good driver. So one day she says, you know, we're going, we're going to go to run an errand, and so we go to the DMV. And uh, I'm at the front counter, and she says, ask them if they have the written test in Korean, in the Korean language. So I asked the lady, do you have it in Korean? They said, no. English or Spanish? I said, well, English. And then she says, ask them if you can translate this for me. So I said, can I, you know, my mom can't really read English that well. Can I help her with the test and translate for her? She's like, oh, yeah, no problem. I'm a young kid, so she's not thinking anything. <laughs> <clears throat> my mom was very smart. She had planned this out for a while, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm there. It's like a little cubicle, right? You take the written test. 
And she says, okay, you know, help me read number one. So I read number one, you know, 25 miles in a slow zone, I don't know, whatever, construction zone. And then she says, what's the answer, A, B, or C? I said, B. <laughs> I, read the t I read the book, right? <laughs> so don't tell nobody, but I think I helped my mom pass that test. <laughs> but don't get it too, my mom can drive, right? She had to take the physical driving test. My mom can drive, I promise. But, um, but those are the things that I, I realized at a young age. My mom relied on me for a lot of these things, and, and I took on a lot of responsibility. And at the time, I never thought about it, but as I reflect back, I was learning a lot of important skills, right? I learned responsibility. I learned how to be, uh, um, she could rely on me, right? And it helped my self-confidence, because I started to feel like I can do things, right? I was at a young age, I could start doing things. Um, and these are important foundational skills that I learned at a young age that I never realized. So I want you to think about your role and, and the responsibilities that you have in your life and don't sell yourself short because those are valuable, valuable lessons that you've learned along the way. Anyone here ever play sports at all? Any athletes? Yeah, I mean, I played sports growing up. You know, baseball, Pop Warner football, all those things. And again, those were life lessons that I didn't realize in terms of being able to work with other people, to set goals, and work with other people to achieve goals, um, to collaborate, um, to do your, your responsibility and do your part so it, it, it would serve the, the, the better men of the team. And so those were all important lessons. And so as we talk through this today, I'm going to give you five life lessons that I've learned. And the first one is don't underestimate your real life experiences because they matter. They matter. And so at the time, I never thought of these were leadership skills or I was learning how to do leadership. But as I think back, that's exactly what it was. I was learning how to be self-reliant and, and learning how to be independent, and it was developing my self-confidence. And so if you think about your experiences and you're able to understand people or you're able to read people and you're able to manage relationships and you're able to take on responsibilities, um, you're self-reliant, you're independent, um, you're able to overcome challenges and barriers, um, those help you develop character and, and integrity, and so don't sell yourself short on those experiences because that serves as your foundation for success. I love the theme today, which is persist towards your passion. Is that right? Persist towards your passion? And so as, as I'm thinking about the theme and I think about persisting towards your passion, persist for me implies that it's not easy, that it's, it's hard work, right? That you've got to keep moving forward even though there's barriers and there's roadblocks in the way. Um, you gotta keep moving forward. You gotta find a way to keep moving forward. And when you think about moving towards something, it also implies that there's a sense of direction, that you know what you wanna achieve, you have a goal, um, you have a dream, there's something that you wanna accomplish and you have a purpose. And then I think the word passion. Passion is such a strong word. Don't you love that word? Passion, right? Just, just mm, you got a passion, right? Just passionate, <laughs> right? Just feels like, mm, like good, right? And that implies that it's something that's personal, it's important, and that it matters. It's something that you care deeply about, right? So if you think about it, and you, you think about persist towards your passion, for me what that means is once you know where you're going, and you have goals, and you have dreams, and you have aspirations, and the important piece is you know why, why those goals and aspirations are important to you, and you have the ability to stay focused, and you're able to overcome hardships and barriers and the roadblocks in our lives, then for me, I would think that you're more likely to be successful, okay? You're likely to be successful. So if you think about anyone who's been successful in life, usually you'll find that that person has a story, and in their story, usually there's a hiccup along the way. There's a failure. There's a lesson learned. Think about your life, and usually there's a transition point. There's a point in your life where you, like, where you say to yourself, you know what, this is not working for me. I gotta change this up. I gotta do something different. And for us, that, that transition point may be different. It may be more dramatic for someone else. It may be more challenging for someone else. But there's a moment in time where each of us, if we think back and say, gosh, you know what? This, this is what changed me. And this is the experience that made me want to do this. And it may be the experience that brought you here to Long Beach City. It may be the experience that made you wanna to decide to get your education um, or to come back to school. Uh, for me, you know, I, I mentioned I played sports all my life, and I was, I was small, man. My mom is like, I put my head, my chin on my mom's head. She's like four-something, right? So she's really small. So being a football player, you know, I mean, and you have a small mom, that wasn't really, you know, ideal. Um, and so what happened for me was everyone told me, you can't play football, man. You're too small. 
you're too small, right? And people b didn't believe in me. And for me, when, when someone tells me, and I don't know where this came from, but when someone tells me that I can't do something, I get like this fire inside of my belly. And I don't say nothing, but it just like burns in me. And then I say, you know what? I'm going to prove you wrong. And I'm going to do everything I can to show you that I can do it. Okay? And, and so for me, part of that motivation is just to prove people wrong. I, I hate when people you know, underestimate what I can do. And so that for me, that's part of my motivation, and that's part of my transition point. Um, I think for me, I've, I also had a, a transition experience my first year in college. And I, I tend to think I'm, I'm pretty successful now in my career and, and what I've wanted to do. And as I think back to what that transition point was, it was a situation where this was at UC Davis, and I was walking across the quad. It was my first year. Um, and this guy comes up to me out of nowhere. And I'm going to class, right? And, and he says, hey, uh, you know, are you black and Asian? No one's ever asked, you know, asked me that before. So I'm like, yeah, you know. I'm black and Korean, and I, I looked at him, I was like, wait, you kind of look like me, right? <laughs> like, wait, you black and Asian too? You know, because where I grew up in Vacaville, up near Sacramento, there weren't very, there was nobody that looked like me, right? Everyone just said I was black and something else, right? But they didn't, they didn't really understand. And so, um, so he kind of looked like me, and he's like, yeah, I'm black and Japanese. I said, oh. I said, well, my name is Daryl. He said, my name is JP. He said, I'm a president of a new club, the African Asian Bicultural Coalition. Right? The AABC club, right? <laughs> he said, we have a club meeting. I want you to come to the club meeting. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, I'm new to the college, don't know a lot of people. It's a great opportunity to meet people. That's what you're supposed to do in college. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll be at the club meeting. So I go to the club meeting, and there weren't a lot of people that showed up. And um, I started attending these meetings, and JP, you got to know, was very passionate about this club. And he was a founder of this club. And at the time, this is when the Rodney King incident had occurred in Los Angeles. And there was a lot of conflict, particularly between the African American community and the Asian American community, not only in Los Angeles, but across the country. And so what he wanted to do was he wanted to have this huge conference at UC Davis in the spring. This was in the fall. In the spring, he wanted to have this huge conference to bring leaders from both communities to talk about it and to have some dialogue and figure out what we can do in our communities to address these issues and address this conflict. So he was really passionate about this club, and that was the purpose, was to have this conference. So he, he comes up and he, he says, eventually, later that quarter, it was a quarter system, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm graduating. He said, I'm going to law school. He said, but, you know, Daryl, you've been the one that's been coming to the meetings. He said, plus, you're only a freshman. You're going to be here for four years. I want you to take over this club. I want you to be the club president. I'm thinking the club president, like, first, shouldn't there be, like, an election? Like, <laughs> how can you just make me the club president, right? And I've never been involved. I didn't know what that meant. But I, I just knew he was so passionate about it. And I'm the type of, I'm a nice guy, right? So I'm thinking, well, this, this is so important to you. You care about it? I mean, OK, I'll be the club president. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't know what that meant. So I was the club president. JP goes off to law school, and he's gone. So there was a list of people that he told me to call that were interested in the club, the officers, so to speak. So I call them up and tell them we want to have a meeting. They're like, you know what, Daryl, I'm about to graduate. I'm working. I'm busy. You know, I'm in my major now, and my major's tough. I, I, can't, I can't be a part of the club. So I'm thinking, man, I called everybody that was on the list. And I was still kind of shy in college, right? So I'm not going to go up to somebody in the quad and meet him like he met me. That just wasn't my personality. So I'm thinking, man, this is really rough. My school is getting busy. I need to find a job. So he gave me a big old binder. And what I did was I put that binder in my closet in my room. I set it aside. And I went about my business, going to class, got my backpack, meeting people, right? So life was good until one day I got a phone call. Who called me? JP. Daryl, what's going on, man? How you doing? JP? Yeah, this is JP, man. I, you know. Law school is kicking my butt, but, you know, I, I'm excited about this conference. We're getting closer. I got the speakers lined up. I got the room. I want to come and talk to the club. We need to have a meeting. I need to let them know what they need to do to make this happen. I'm like, man, JP, man, I've been really busy with school. Work is no joke. I got two part-time jobs, JP, and I've just been really busy. He said, well, just tell me when your next meeting is. Well, JP, there's, I don't have a meeting scheduled, man. I've just been really busy. He's like, that's OK. Just make some flyers, pass them out, and just tell people to get there. Make those phone calls and get people there. I want to come talk to everybody. I'm excited about this. I said, well, JP, you know, 
the challenge is, is I, don't have a, I don't have any meetings scheduled. There, there are no meetings. And I said, in fact, you know, I've been so busy, JP, you know, we, we, there's really not really a, a club. <laughs> and JP said, he said, what do you mean there's no club? What are you saying, Daryl? Right? What are you saying there's no club? I said, JP, I, I, I've been so busy, man. I mean, I, I really haven't done anything. And it was quiet, like for a long time. <laughs> like uncomfortably, I started to sweat, you know? <laughs> JP was a big brother, right? So, <laughs> so, um, so he said, he said, so you're saying there's no club? And I just heard like him just ex exhale, like, like he didn't like get mad, he didn't say anything, but I could just tell. You can just sense something over the phone, right? You can just get a sense of that feeling. And he didn't say anything and he just hung up the phone. That was like the worst thing, right? Like we didn't even have a chance to talk about it. I couldn't explain anything else. He just hung up the phone. And I was like, wow, that was not good. <laughs> have you ever like disappointed anybody? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like someone had high expectations or they had hopes or they wanted something so bad and they relied on you to do something and you didn't come through, like, that wasn't me, because I helped out my mom, I was very responsible, but I was in over my head as a freshman, and it wasn't as important to me as it was to JP at the time. And so that was the moment where I said, man, I failed. And I never really failed at anything, but, and I failed, and, I, and it, I felt horrible. And so that was a moment for me where I said, you know what, I, I can't ever do this again. This is not a good, and to this day, you could tell, I mean, this still bothers me, right? I mean, to this day. I mean, I was, I was hoping I never ran into JP in the street because, man, he might, he might take me down, right? And I, I've never seen him. I've never talked to him after this. I don't even know if that club still exists. But when I started working in education and I started to understand my own um, weaknesses, which is I, I wasn't prepared. I didn't know leadership. I didn't know how to go about this. And I didn't have a lot of confidence. And so what I committed to doing was making sure that no one else was ever in that position again, right? So it wasn't about me now, it was about other people. So the students I worked with, I wanted to make sure that they took advantage of these opportunities because the thing to understand is that I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't raise my hand and say, hey, hey, pick me, club president, right? That didn't happen. So you have to understand that people are gonna come to you with opportunities, whether you're ready or not. People are gonna expect things from you, even if you're not ready. So my challenge for you is you gotta be ready, right? You gotta be ready and don't wait. Cause part of me, I thought, well, I'm not a leader yet, I, gotta, you know, I'm gonna, I can work on that when I graduate, you know, when I get about to get a job. But that's why I'm so happy that you guys are here because you're starting to understand and you realize that you don't have to wait to be a leader, right? You don't have to wait to develop, to develop these skills. And so it's really important that you start now. And it's an ongoing process, it doesn't stop. It's a lifelong process. So part of this is, is making sure that I learn from my experience and prepare others as well. The other lesson that I learned is we all need a why in our lives. A why, W-H-Y, right, a why, a reason. So it's not only knowing what we wanna do, it's not knowing, only knowing about our goals and our dreams and our aspirations, but it's also understanding why is that important to you, okay? Because if you get to the why, that's where you start to identify your passion and that's where your motivation comes from when things get tough. For you, um, it could be that why could be because you want to make a difference, because you want to serve, you want to help other people, right? And that's important. For me, I talked about it earlier, but my why was, one, wanting to prove people wrong. So that, that's just, that was part of my motivation growing up all the time. And my bigger why, actually, is my family. The bigger why for me is my family, and, and in particular, my mom. She came to the, the United States and didn't speak any English. Her job was, she was a food server. So we, we lived up near uh, Travis Air Force Base. And she would work in the cafeteria line and she would serve food to the GIs. And that was her job, right? Woke up early and she just did that. That's what she did. And she worked long hours and, you know, she wouldn't get treated right and she'd get yelled at at work and stuff. And so knowing how hard she worked for me, for me when I had an opportunity, I was, I was not going to fail because she put in all that effort for me to have a better life. So my big why when, when times got tough was to think about, I got to do this not for me, but for, for her and for my family. So I challenge you to think about what is that why in your life? What is your go-to when times get tough and you have those challenges and those roadblocks? What is it that's going to push you through? Okay? And you all can easily identify what those whys are for you in your life. Okay? So find your why. The other lesson that I've learned 
is to be successful, you have to have an understanding of who you are. So before you can be in a relationship, before you can commit to anything, if you don't understand who you are, no one else is going to understand anything about you. Okay? So that's got to be your foundation. And that means understanding your strengths, your weaknesses, your values, being in touch with your emotions. Fellas, being in touch with your emotions, <laughs> being able to manage those emotions, right? Understanding who you are and who you strive to be, okay, is so important. And that's got to be the foundation for anything. And that's the foundation for anyone who's successful. They know clearly who they are and what they're about. So when someone asks you who are you and what you are about, you need to have an answer. You need to have an answer. If someone says, what's important to you? What are you passionate about? You need to have an answer. Why is your education important to you? You need to have an answer. And this is all internal work. And it takes time. Okay? You're not going to wake up tomorrow and have all the answers and be like, I figured it out. I know everything about me. You know? it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's life lessons and it's experiences, it's failures, it's ups and downs. But you have to be mindful of it and you have to start to fill in those blanks and start to answer those questions for yourself. Once you know who you are, and I love this word, once you know who you are, you have to be congruent, congruent with who you are. Congruent, what does that mean? Congruent means being consistent, okay, between what you think, what you say, and what you do, okay? I, I mean, I've been, before I got married, I've been married for four years, but before I got married, I was in relationships with, you know, with folks before, and, and I would say all this stuff, and they say, well, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Actions speak louder than words, right? And, and what I was saying was sounded pretty good, too, right? <laughs> but it's not about what you say, it's actions, right? And people want to see that you're consistent between what you say and what you do, and your behavior matters. Um, there was a, a research study that was done of employees um, who work at Fortune 500 companies across the United States a few years ago. And they asked these employees, what do you value most in your leaders? And by far, the, the number one answer, 88% of the people who responded to this, the one value that they valued most than anything else was honesty. Honesty. Sounds simple, right? Honest. I just want people to be honest with me, right? So when you think about understanding who you are and, and what you're about and to be congruent, honesty is a critical piece to that. Because once you're honest with other people, it's going to improve your relationships. That's where you earn respect from people. That's where you become authentic and you have integrity is through your behavior, right? And it has to be aligned. So one way to test your congruency is, and you don't have to do it now, but I want you to think about Five words that you would use to describe yourself, right? You would just jot that down. Five words you would use to describe yourself. Then you go to people that are close to you, your friends, you know, whoever's close to you, and say, give me five words that you think describe me, okay? And what you want, the goal is you want those words to be similar, right? If I wrote words that said, I'm confident, I'm funny, I'm smart, and then I asked my wife, and she's like, no sense of humor, arrogant. <laughs> You know, we, we got a problem because now I see myself differently than how other people see me. And to be congruent and be consistent, you want to see yourself in the way other people see you as well. Okay, so that has to align as well. We all know when someone says something and they do something else, we have words for that, right? A hypocrite or whatever we call them. And, and you don't respect people like that. And it's hard to be friends with people who do that. So I really challenge you to have an understanding of yourself, to be congruent, and to be honest because that's going to improve your relationships, um, not only here, but just throughout the rest of your life, OK? Easier said than done, right? So once you know who you are, once you are congruent and you're consistent, lesson number four is to have a positive mindset. Have a positive mind. I, I think I'm a positive person. I have, you know, I like to be positive, and I, I, I like to be around people who are positive. I hate when people like just are negative around me because then that brings me down. It just takes my energy. It just drains me, right? And I just, I don't, I don't like being around that. I want to be positive. Uh, there's an author, T.F. Hodge, who says, the sky is not my limit. I am. The sky is not my limit. I am. And that's so true. When we talk about our mindset, most times we're the ones that limit ourselves because of what we think. We put ourselves in a box, or we put limits on ourselves simply by what we think. Has, has anyone ever seen a hypnotist in person, ever, like live? Do you believe in it? Uh, yeah, I got it. You, oh, see? Man, OK. So before I went to see a hypnotist live, I was like, man, whatever. That's fake. They're paying these folks or whatever, right? 
But it was real, right? Was it real? Was it real? For you? No, no. Oh, you didn't believe it? Ah, oh, okay. Oh, did they? Ah, oh, well, you went to the wrong hypnotist. So, so check this out. The one I went to was like a real hypnotist. No, I'm playing. <laughs> a real hypnotist. And what happened was they had um, bottled waters on stage. They had like four people on stage, right? And uh, this was at a leadership conference, by the way, National Leadership Conference. They had four bottled waters on stage and four people on stage. And they said, um, you know, pick up this bottle, waddle, this bottle, bottle of water, and it, it's as light as a feather, right? So they're throwing it around, et cetera, et cetera. And then they said, now we're going to put lead in this bottle, and now I want you to lift up this bottle. And I, I, I wasn't hypnotized, but I, I swear, maybe they played along, they were good actors, but they could not lift up that bottle of water, right? Because they believed that it weighed a ton. Okay, so have you ever met, and maybe this is you, have you ever met someone who says, I'm not good at math. I hate math. I suck at math, right? And what happens when they take a math test? They don't do very well. Someone says, man, I hate to speak publicly. I get nervous. You know, it makes me so nervous when I speak in front of people. And what happens? I get nervous, right? Okay, because you tell yourself, right? If I tell my daughter, she can't run yet, but if I tell her, don't run, what does she think of? She think run, right? <laughs> right? So our mind tells us what we want to do, right? So we got to start being mindful of the messages that we send ourselves. Any of you ever exercise, work out, lift weights maybe? Okay. Um, when, I was, when I played football, you know, part of it is you have to max out. You have to determine how much you can bench press, right? What's your limit in terms of bench pressing? And so if I were to max out on a bench press and lay under that bar with all this weight on it, what do you think I'm telling myself before I lift that weight? Yeah, am I telling myself, man, this is heavy. Oh my gosh, there's no way I'm going to be able to lift this weight up. This is going to smash my chest. Like, what am I doing, right? I don't tell myself that. I tell myself, I can do this. I have self-talk, so I call myself D. I can do this, D. You can do this, right? <laughs> D, you can do this, right? You can do this, okay, you can, you, you can make this happen, right? So that self-talk is so powerful, okay? So when I talk about positive mindset, you have to be mindful of the messages that you tell yourself because we are our own worst enemy in terms of being able to limit ourselves, okay? And, and it doesn't help when people, you know, kind of buy into that. So you also have to surround yourself with positive people who's also going to support the, the mindset that you have, okay? Very, very important. The last lesson is to take risks and step out of your comfort zone often. That's hard to do, right? Because we, we like to stick with what we know, right? We like to stay in that little circle and stay in that little box. Um, but that also limits our opportunities and it limits our potential, okay? So I challenge you to be mindful about taking a risk and stepping out of that comfort zone. If it's, you know, like me in class, back then, my challenge to myself would have been, I need to raise my hand. I need to participate in class, right? That's the challenge. That's stepping out of my comfort zone. So whatever your comfort zone is, you need to identify where that is and, and take a reach out of that comfort zone. Whether it's about thinking about where you want to transfer to, right? Think outside the box and take, be willing to take a risk um, in terms of those options and those, those possibilities. Because the more that you step out of your comfort zone, the more you're going to grow and the more you're going to learn okay, about yourself uh, and what you're able to do. So at the end of the day, we know what it takes to be successful, right? We all know what it takes to get an A in a class. What does it take to get an A in a class? You gotta study, hard work, you gotta show up to class, right? We know what it takes, right? And I knew what it took. I, didn't, I wasn't a straight A student, right? So it wasn't a matter that I didn't know, it was a matter of me not willing to do the work. Okay, so when we talk about success, it's hard work, it's not easy, okay? And you gotta commit to it. And so my challenge for you is just be willing to do what it takes. Be willing to do what it takes. Be willing to not underestimate your life experiences. Be willing to understand the why in your life and find that motivation, that passion. Be willing to understand yourself. Be willing to be honest and to be congruent. And be willing to have that positive mindset. Be willing to take a risk and step, step outside of your comfort zone. Um, it's not easy, but the hard work will pay off. I promise. All right, so I want to leave you with a video here. This is, man, this is like my favorite video, and you're going to see why in a moment. This is about a young girl who won a contest to sing the national anthem at an NBA playoff game. Okay, so this is national TV, 
and she's in an arena with over 20,000 people, okay? And now to honor America and so the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome as voted by you the fans our winner of the Toyota Give the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. So, you know she knows the words to the national anthem. You know she practiced that in the shower, in the car, any <laughs> chance she got, right? She knew the words. But sometimes in life we mess up. And she froze, right? And if you saw her hands started shaking, she looked around, she didn't know what to do. And you really couldn't hear it in the video, but some people cheered her on, but some people started to boo. 16-year-old girl, they started to boo her. And what's important for me is the fact that Maurice Cheeks, who's the assistant coach, of the Portland Trail, Trailblazers at the time, went up to her, put his arm around her, and said, you know what, I got this. I got you. Let's do this. We're in this together, right? He kind of coached her through it. No one told Maurice Cheeks to do that, right? He took the initiative to do it. And, and, and that's my point when I talk about, you know, having a positive mindset and, and just being positive. It took that one positive experience, right, to change the whole outcome of that, right? So everyone in the arena towards the end started to sing along, and it was really kind of this whole sense of community. And so my challenge for you is just to recognize that there's going to be times where we mess up, we have hiccups along the road, other people around us are going to have hiccups, and our role isn't to make fun of them or to bring them down, it's to put our arm around and say, you know what, I got you, we're in this together, okay? Because if I'm at, in that situation, I want you to do the same to me, okay? So part of this success thing is about also understanding our responsibility to other people. And it's not just about ourselves and us being successful, right? Because I want all my friends, I want everyone else to be successful too, so we can enjoy that successful life together, whatever that looks like, right? I don't wanna be up there by myself and be like, hey, I got no one to hang out with, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to help others along. And in the same way, when we think about leadership and we think about doing the right thing, it's about reaching back and helping those around us as well. So work hard, stay positive, and continue to strive to achieve your dreams and your goals. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.